Good day. In the first part of my program yesterday, I discussed at some length the uh, discussions that have been taking place around President Macron's suggestions that uh, Western troops, troops from the European Union and from NATO, be inserted into Ukraine. It appeared that he was going to provide or make a address to the French people um, yesterday evening. I was anticipating that he might even announce a deployment of French troops to Ukraine. And I discussed at very considerable length a very powerful and, in some respects, rather uh, terrifying interview that President Putin of Russia gave to the Russian journalist Sergei Kisilyov, in which Putin made it absolutely clear that if French or European or NATO troops entered Ukraine, as far as the Russians were concerned, they would do so as enemy combatants. Putin even referred to them as one point as invaders, and Putin also pointedly turned Macron's words against him. Macron has said that it's time for the West to uh, no longer have red lines when it comes to Russia. Putin responded that in that case, if there were no red lines towards Russia, there would be no red lines by Russia against any Western states that adopted that sort of approach. So a very, very tough series of warnings from Putin with pointed reminders peppered throughout the interview that Russia is a nuclear power, that it has strategic nuclear forces, the most powerful and the most modern in the world, as he went out of his way to remind everybody, and that, as Putin said, these nuclear weapons are there to be used in the event that Russia's existence is threatened. And at another point in his interview, he also said, Putin also said, that there was a fundamental difference in outlook between the French and other Western powers and the Russians about Ukraine. For the West, Ukraine ultimately is a strategic play, an attempt to improve their tactical or geopolitical position. For the Russians, it is a life or death issue, and that will frame their decisions accordingly. Well, as I said, a very powerful, in some ways scary, set of warnings from Putin, and a very clear set of warnings from Putin. And all of this said on the eve of what I understood to be President Macron's address to the French people, in which I expected that Macron would announce the very thing that Putin was warning against, which, is, which was the deployment of French troops to Ukraine. Well, the evening wore on. No address from the Elysee happened. And instead, after a delay, what we got was a rather chaotic live news conference. And a news conference that lasted all of 30 minutes. And which was, frankly, so far as I'm concerned, an exercise in total confusion. The first thing is that Macron did not announce the deployment of French troops to Ukraine. He went out of his way to go on saying that this was an option which could not and should not be ruled out. He said that um, Europe could not allow, the West could not allow Russia to prevail in Ukraine. Doing so would be the end of Europe in some undefined way, 
the end of the security, end of Europe's security, the end of France's security as well. The Russian bear will once again be at the gates, waiting to burst in. And anyway, um, that was a situation that could not apparently be permitted to happen. So an awful lot of that. But none of that takes away from the fact that Macron also said, or rather that French troops were not currently going to be deployed to Ukraine. And he also said further things which cast doubt upon the idea that they will be deployed to Ukraine at all. He said that France is a force for peace. He said that whether or not French troops are deployed to Ukraine will depend on Russian actions, which I find a most bizarre and weird um, comment. Was it intended to be a threat? Was it a suggestion to the Russians that if they go on to win the war or look like they're about to win the war, then the French troops will be deployed after all in even more dangerous conditions for them than prevail today? A very strange comment indeed. He also said that France would not lead in this operation, which, again, I have to say, I found extremely odd. It suggested that the French intend to hide behind their allies. And when one unpacked it all, it, it all seemed to imply that as this whole idea of deployments, troop deployments to Ukraine, certainly by France, has been put perhaps permanently on the back burner. Well, one would like to think so. One would like to think that what happened is that over the course of yesterday, as the warnings from Putin rolled in, and by the way, I would say that they were warnings, not threats. It's not as if Putin is directly threatening France or Europe. He's not saying that unless the Europeans and the French do as he wants them to do, he will attack these countries. What he is saying is that if French and other troops enter Ukraine, then they are combatants in the already existing Ukrainian war, as far as the Russians are concerned. Anyway, I would like to believe <laughs> that what has happened is that, in effect, Putin called Macron's bluff, that um, Putin made it absolutely clear that the presence of French troops in Ukraine would be unacceptable to the Russians, and that Macron understood that with the Russians taking that kind of stance, the introduction of French troops into Ukraine is a non-starter. Well, I think probably that is the case. But we're also getting news today that Macron is heading to Berlin, where he's going to have talks with Chancellor Scholz of Germany. And apparently Donald Tusk, the Polish Prime Minister, is due to join these talks shortly. And one does wonder what all of these discussions now are about. The way that Macron spoke yesterday made it fairly clear that there is no imminent deployment of Western troops to Ukraine going to take place. I should stress when I say that, that the reality is, as the Russians have regularly pointed out, there are already significant numbers of Western troops in Ukraine acting as civilian advisors, uh, pretending to be mercenaries or contractors, probably operating air defence systems and other systems. There's probably a significant number of Western troops already in Ukraine. But of course, what Macron is talking about 
is an overt and open deployment of, say, a French brigade and um, other troops with tanks and perhaps air cover or something like that to Ukraine as well. And it's clear that that idea, massive escalation, dramatic escalation, as it would be, has been, if not fully abandoned, put on the back burner at the present time. But then again, we come back to this meeting in Berlin. And what is it for? Is it that the Germans have summoned Macron to Paris and are going to give him a dressing down and are going to tell him under no circumstances persist with this talk of deploying troops from Europe to Ukraine? There are indications from Berlin that that might be the case. Chancellor Scholz has reiterated multiple times the German troops will not become involved in the fighting, directly involved in the fighting in Ukraine. He has categorically now ruled out delivery of Taurus missiles to Ukraine. The Bundestag, the lower house of the German parliament, has for the third time voted against delivery of Taurus missiles to Ukraine. We were told a few days ago that the decision by Germany not to supply Taurus missiles to Ukraine was final. And Chancellor Scholz has gone out of his way to explain that one of the reasons why Taurus missiles cannot be supplied to Ukraine is because they would require German technical assistance to operate them. That would mean having the Germans, the German military itself, carry out some of the programming of the missiles. That was, of course, all discussed and confirmed in that recording of German generals discussing doing that very thing, which the Russians released about a week ago. Anyway, Schultz, Chancellor Scholz has said that this is absolutely precluded and there are suggestions that it is contrary to Germany's basic law, in effect, to its constitution. It's not formally a constitution, but let's call it Germany's basic law. So, the German government, to all appearances, is ruling out the idea of deploying troops to Ukraine. And, in fact, the German defence minister, Boris Pistorius, who within Germany, has the reputation of being something of a hawk on the topic of Ukraine, has also ruled this idea out. And he has even said that discussion of this proposal should stop. So, on the face of it, the Germans are taking a solid line in opposition to what uh, Macron is proposing or has been proposing to do. So perhaps they have invited Macron to Berlin to explain this all to him in person. But then of course you get the visit to Berlin by the Pol Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk. And Poland has been giving contradictory messages on this same topic. The Polish Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski, who is known to be a person with very strong neocon views, so is a rather more complex person than that might imply. Anyway, he has at times sort of hinted that at some future point Poland might be open to this idea. But Donald Tusk himself has firmly ruled it out. There is a strong upswell of opposition within Poland itself to the continued support for Ukraine. The farmers in Poland have been protesting. The truckers in Poland have been pr protesting. The Polish border has been closed. Um, 
as a result of these protests, the border with Ukraine, that is. Um, an attempt some weeks ago of the Ukrainian Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Schmigal, to come to the border and to talk to some of these protesters proved completely unsuccessful. I think that Donald Tusk perhaps also understands that the mood in Poland is absolutely not favourable to an intervention, a military intervention by Poland in Ukraine. So perhaps the Poles are also coming to this meeting in Berlin in order to say to Macron the same thing. Who knows? But anyway, for the moment at least, it does look to me as if Putin has successfully called Macron's bluff. I suspect that over and above opposition to this idea of sending troops to Ukraine from other European countries, the United States at the present time is not attracted to this idea at all. They will certainly have registered the warnings that Putin gave very explicitly and very clearly in his interview with Sergei Kiselyov. Um, they do not want to be drawn into a situation in Ukraine which might develop into an outright nuclear war. Um, and, uh, well, World War Three type scenarios. They certainly do not want to be pushed into a position where they are asked by their European allies to come to the rescue of those allies if they get themselves into trouble in with the Russians in Ukraine. And I suspect that the Americans are probably also strongly hostile to this idea. So all the facts suggest, all the publicly available facts suggest that the Russians have called Macron's bluff. But in this conflict, one can never know. And I, for one, would not be surprised if at some point in the future, as the military situation deteriorates, some kind of call for a Western military intervention in the conflict might not be resurrected. Anyway, what this incident has again demonstrated is that without the Americans, the Europeans, militarily speaking, in Ukraine can do nothing. I've discussed in recent programs these apocalyptic scenarios about what would be needed to provide air support to European troops in Ukraine. There would be a massive clash between the Russian and American air forces. It's all but inconceivable that at some point nuclear weapons would not be used. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, in a live stream we did with him on the Duran yesterday, basically made the same point. But the point is that the only people in Europe who anyway have an air force capable of engaging the Russian air force in the skies over Ukraine are the Americans. And one must come back to the general state of the European armies. The British army is a very bad way. It's um, down to 40 serviceable tanks. Its air force is having to scrap around 30 typhoon fighters. Britain's entire um, arsenal of self-propelled artillery 
has already been dispatched and handed over to Ukraine, where the Russians have been systematically destroying it. So the British, with a relatively small army, um, numbering in total, I believe, something like 75,000 men, perhaps after strenuous effort, they might be able to cobble together an expeditionary force of about 20,000 men, though I know a lot of people think that is inconceivable given the present numbers. But it would take months to do, and it would, in effect, take up the entirety of the British Army's available combat power. Anyway, the British are in no position to do it. I gather that the Germans are not in a position to do it either. Um, their military, as is well known, is also in relatively bad shape. And, well, I know less about the French military. This despite the fact that I've had more chance encounters, in fact, significantly more chance encounters, encounters with French military officers than I have had with British ones. And I should say, and for the record, that I have found them to be mostly impressive people. But I understand that the French military is in a condition not that different from that of Germany's and Britain's. Apparently the total size of the French army is around 112 thousand men. It's supposed that just as the British might perhaps after months of preparation be able to put together an expeditionary force, a properly equipped expeditionary force of around 20,000 men um, stripping their army or what's left of their army of its remaining combat power. Well, the French perhaps might be able to put together a force of around 12,000 men. Again, at the risk of stripping their army of its remaining combat power. France apparently has 200 Leclerc tanks on its inventory, but a significant part of those are unserviceable. There are more tanks in store, about 160 or so in store, apparently, but they're basically used to supply spare parts to the others. Just saying. Um, France gave a significant number of Caesar howitzers to um, Ukraine. I'm getting reports every day now, more and more Caesar howitzers being destroyed by the Russians. There were two more Caesar howitzers, apparently, destroyed by the Russians about a day or so ago. So it doesn't look as if the French are in much of a position to contribute much to an expeditionary force either. And again, this would take months of preparation. And the essential thing to understand, and this was explained very clearly in a recent interview, by Scott Ritter, who has been heavily involved in logistical issues. Deploying and supplying whatever expeditionary forces the Europeans by themselves could put together would require an enormous amount of technical support from the United States. It would be the United States that would have to provide the equipment, a lot of the fuel, <laughs> the uh, um, other supplies, perhaps some of the artillery shells, the um, air transport, all of those things, in order to keep this European expeditionary force in a combat-ready condition where it could operate in Ukraine. And of course, if all of these armies, the French, 
the British, the German, the Polish, all cooperated on this thing, then perhaps after about six months, a year, they might be able to deploy maybe 30, 40,000 men in, to in total, 50,000 if you want to push the envelope further. The Russians are recruiting into their army around 40,000 men a month, according to the figures which they release. I saw an article uh, provided by Jeff Roberts, uh, circulated by Jeff Roberts, the historian from Strana, which cast doubt on that number. It said that the Russians perhaps are actually recruiting only half that number of men each month. I don't believe that to be the case, by the way. I understand that even Western governments have now come round to accepting that Russian figures about the number of men who are volunteering to join the Russian army every month are true. But all right, let's assume that it is indeed the case that the Russians are only recruiting 20,000 men a month. Well, in that case, the Russians would make up the total number of the total number of men would recruit the total number of men in any European expeditionary force over a two or three month period. So this doesn't make any kind of military sense and it is impossible without the Americans. And by the way, it is also becoming increasingly clear that without the Americans, Economically speaking, the show in Ukraine cannot be kept on the road either. The Ukrainian government has now admitted that it has a $37 billion uh, dollar hole in its budget. Now, for some countries, $37 billion might not sound like an awful lot. For Ukraine, with its economy already in a deeply critical position before the war and largely destroyed during it, $37 billion is an impossible sum. There is no realistic way that Ukraine can find it, for example, by increasing tax revenue or by increasing grain exports the last the last almost certainly by now largely maxed out so unless the west supplies the funding to close this hole in the budget then ukraine is going to be left with impossible economic choices either to launch deep cuts in spending, which would plunge Ukraine's economy into an ever deeper crisis, a massive contraction, and which would immiserate much of the Ukrainian population. Or, as many suspect, would actually happen to start printing money to cover the budget deficit, which Given that Ukraine's credit rating has now been slashed to, I believe, CC, in other words, junk levels, deep junk levels, just above <laughs> insolvency levels, in fact. Well, if an economy like that starts to print money, a descent into hyperinflation becomes... I would have thought, all but, un all but unstoppable. So, the Europeans and the Americans have been filling the budget gap up to now. After an enormous amount of stress, 
the Europeans were able to agree a 55 billion euro package for Ukraine, overcoming Hungarian opposition. But this package is spaced out over four years, so it doesn't close the funding gap, not remotely. Uh, most European governments are now themselves running into deficit problems. There's still some funding being provided by Germany, and the German government has been talking about increasing funding for Ukraine, though this is becoming deeply unpopular within Germany itself, or increasingly unpopular within Germany itself. It's difficult to believe that the Europeans can close, can plug this hole. The only people who theoretically can are the Americans, though it ought to be said that the Americans are now running into budget problems of their own. In February, apparently, the federal government in the United States only raised in taxes half the amount that it spent, just saying. But anyway, the point is that for the moment, Congress is not prepared to pass an appropriation to provide that kind of funding for Ukraine. So without the Americans, the Europeans are nowhere. There is this idea of President Pavel's to buy arms, shells, for Ukraine on the international arms market. I've expressed my scepticism about this. The Czechs are now admitting that the earliest point at which the Ukrainians might receive some of these shells is June, which, to my mind, calls into question the reality of this entire project. Over the course of his press conference yesterday, Macron straightforwardly admitted that French industry is in no position to sustain production for the kind of long-duration, high-intensity war that we see in Ukraine, which essentially admits that France, at least, is out of the running in terms of providing Ukraine with additional equipment, shells and such, such things. Um, so, shortages of shells, other equipment, no realistic way that the, that the Europeans can make up the difference. No realistic way that the Europeans can make up the funding gaps. No realistic way that the Europeans can deploy troops to Ukraine. They would need the Americans to do all of these things. And despite what some are saying, I still get the sense that within the political class in the United States overall, enthusiasm for this project is waning. Anyway, on that topic, no less a person than our old friend, Josip Borrell, has just gone to Washington and he's been trying to explain to the Americans how urgently needed they are if support for Ukraine is going to continue. Reuters has an interesting report about his visit. It says that EU's foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, said on Thursday, after holding meetings in Washington, that securing new support for Ukraine could not wait since the outcome of the war in Ukraine will be decided this spring and summer. Um, in other words, that unless Ukraine is supported quickly, then sometime in the spring and summer, or, or summer, things will start to collapse. The economy will run out of money, the army will run out of weapons, and by the way, also of men, and any support must therefore be given now. And he, Reuters then goes on to say, amid doubts over continuing US military aid to Kiev, 
Borrell told reporters that his message for US policymakers was, whatever has to be done, it has to be done quickly. It, it's true for us, we have to speed up, we have to increase our support to do more and quicker. That's why we are increasing our industrial defense capacities and it's also true for the US. The next months will be decisive Many analysts expect a major Russian offensive this summer, and Ukraine cannot wait until the results of the next elections. So, in effect, he's telling the Americans, we can do what we can, we're trying our best, but realistically, without you, this war is lost. Whether the war can be won even with the Americans is another matter. Many expert commentators, and well, I wouldn't set myself as a, up as an expert, but I certainly believe that whether with the $60 billion, $61 billion aid package or not, so far as the West is concerned, the war is lost. Anyway, what in the meantime has been going on in the war? The answer is that it continues and things for Ukraine go from bad to worse. The first thing to say is that yet again last night there was a major air raids uh, across Ukraine. I say air raids, drone attacks by the Russians across Ukraine. The Ukrainians claimed that they shot down all 27 Geranium-2 drones that the Russians launched against Ukraine. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but everybody concedes that there were devastating strikes on Odessa last night. The um, Western media has been covering them heavily. Some civilians tragically were killed over the course of these strikes. I doubt that the civilians were the targets, however, and one gets the sense that you, Odessa, or at least the industrial and military facilities around it, are being pounded by the Russians, as, is, as in fact has been true ever since the special military operation began. So, major Russian drone and missile attack, presumably, missiles used against Odessa um, over the course of last night. But of course the big drama last night was not there, but in the continued Ukrainian attempts to break through into Russian territory in Belgorod and Kursk. And as if to underline the point that the Ukrainians are treating wants everybody to think that there's a major battle and offensive going on in Kursk and Belgorod regions. Um, they announced earlier today that Kursk and Belgorod regions are a war zone and um, should be construed accordingly. Well, is that actually true? Well, it is certainly the case that an awful lot of fighting is going on along the border between Ukraine and Russia. I've discussed this previously. I said yesterday that up to that point, up to the time when I made my programme yesterday, the fighting had gone catastrophically against Ukraine, that all the attempts by the Ukrainians to penetrate the Russian border had been disastrously unsuccessful, that Ukraine had suffered extremely severe losses for no apparent gain. Well, that was what I said yesterday, as of the time of making this program. The situation from a Ukrainian point of view is, to all appearances, even worse. Last night witnessed a disastrous special forces operation conducted by the Ukrainian army in this territory. 
an attempt by the Ukrainians to land a force using helicopters to seize a small village in Belgorod region, a village close to the border. And we've had an account of this incident <laughs> from the Russian Defence Ministry, and I'm going to read what it says. On 14th March 2024, the Russian Armed Forces, together with the Border Forces of the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB, thwarted another attempt launched by the Ukrainian Armed Forces to break through the territory of Belgorod region of the Russian Federation, this time near Kozinka. Kozinka is a small village close to the border, not far from the um, town of Graivoron, which is some way to the east, the Russian town of Graivoron, which is some way to the east. Anyway, this is what the Russian Defense Ministry then says happened. At around 1630 Moscow time, that's yesterday afternoon, during daylight, in other words, in order to achieve suddenness, a Ukrainian sabotage group of special operations forces and foreign mercenaries on two MI8 helicopters using the terrain features landed up to 30 people on Ukrainian territory one kilometre away from the state border of the Russian Federation. After the landing, the sabotage group secretly moved towards the village of Kozinka, Belgorod region, located directly near the state border of the Russian Federation, where it entered several houses on its outskirts. In an attempt to advance deeper into the settlement, the Ukrainian saboteurs were detected and stopped by units of the Russian armed forces, together with the border forces of the Russian Federal Security Service. Artillery fire, um, army aviation strikes, and aviation-guided bombs have engaged the enemy to prevent reserves from approaching. The terrain was remotely mined. With significant losses, the Ukrainian saboteurs began retreating back to Ukrainian territory. A group of saboteurs attempted to gain a foothold in one of the houses on Republikanskaya Street, directly adjacent to the straight state border, where it was disabled by units of the Russian armed forces. The remaining saboteurs who had retreated to Ukraine entered the minefield where they were eliminated. At the same time, the tornado multiple launch rocket system, the tornado is the Russian equivalent of the HIMARS, neutralized an enemy group that had advanced to evacuate the wounded and killed Ukrainian saboteurs. The Ukrainian losses amounted to over 50 men. At present, control over Kazinka has been fully restored. The area where the sabotage and reconnaissance group was de de disabled has been mopped up. And then the Russian Defense Ministry gives an overall summary of Ukrainian losses over the course of the last three days. The last three days of Ukrainian attempts to penetrate the Russian border. It says that in general, over the past three days, from 12th to 14th March, the troops of the Zapad, that's the West Group of Forces of the Russian Federation, together with the border forces of the Russian Federal Security Service, have thwarted all attempts of Ukrainian militants, troops in other words, to break through Belgorod and Kursk regions, launched uh, attacks launched by Ukrainian troops have been repelled. Ukrainian losses amounted to more than 1,500 men, with about 500 of them 
non-recoverable. 18 tanks and 23 armoured fighting vehicles have been neutralised. Now that's all a pretty astonishing report altogether. But let's try and unpack what happened first last night. So the Russians say that two MI8 helicopters took off from within Ukraine. They landed a special forces group um, in a field, an open field, on Ukrainian territory, located on Ukrainian territory, at 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon, in other words, in conditions of daylight. This special forces group, about 30 men in total, advanced into this village of Kozinka, which is located on the border. They were rapidly detected by the Russians. The Russians remotely seeded the field through which these Ukrainian troops had crossed to enter the village with mines, thereby both barring their retreat and also barring the advance of any relief force that the Ukrainians might send in their direction to consolidate control of Kazinka. The Russians then say that they engaged this force within Kazinka itself. One group from this force were trapped in some houses on a street, Republikanskaya Street, but were eventually rounded up and either killed or taken prisoner. The remainder tried to flee, flee across the, the field, unaware of the fact that the Russians had seeded that field with mines. By this point, I, I presume it would have been night, and the retreat would therefore have happened during the night time in low visibility conditions. The troops, these fleeing Ukrainian troops stumbled over the mines where many of them were killed. Probably others were also killed by Russian shelling and missile strikes. The Ukrainians, seeing what was happening, then tried to send a relief force not to try to consolidate control of Kazinka, from which, of course, by this point, the initial assault group was retreating, but to evacuate the remaining special forces soldiers who were dying in this minefield. And the unit that the Ukrainian force, the Ukrainian military, sent to try to relieve this force in the minefield was then itself attacked by a rocket strike carried out by a tornado, multiple launch rocket system of the Russian army equipped with precision guided rockets and was itself destroyed. This is a ghastly debacle. The Russians say that around 50 people were killed, which suggests that most of the special forces unit that attempted to carry out this operation, most of them were um, eliminated and that the relieving force were suffered significant losses as well. Well, what to say about this? Firstly, it looks like a chaotic operation. Um, now, I am not remotely a special forces person. I mean, I've never had any dealings with special forces uh, people to the extent that I know. Perhaps I've met some, but I've never actually 
discuss special forces operations with them. I doubt that they would discuss them with me anyway. But I assumed that an operation of this kind would be planned and rehearsed and trained for over many weeks and months. From what I can tell, this operation, well, it, to me, looks like it ha look, gives every sign of having been improvised and cobbled together in a hurry. It doesn't look as if it was properly thought through or planned. There doesn't seem to have been any proper coordination between the special forces group that was sent into Kozinka and whatever force was intended to provide support to it. So that the result was that the Russians were able to isolate the special forces unit and destroy it long before any relief force appeared. And um, you have bizarre decisions, such as the fact that the first part of this operation appears to have been conducted in daylight, before nightfall, a fact, by the way, which may suggest that the operation had been planned in such a hurry that a decision was made to carry out the first part of it in daylight because there would have been worries that if it was done in the dark, the Special Forces troops might lose their way. In other words, a completely chaotic and disorganised operation, and it has ended in disaster. And the same can be said of all of these attacks up to this point along the border. And the losses are horrendous. Now, the Russians say that the Ukrainians have lost 1,500 men, but it's important to say that of those, they say only 500 were non-recoverable which is to say that only 500 were either killed or seriously wounded. And the Russians previously said that on the first day, 243 Ukrainian troops who participated in the attack on the border were killed, actually killed, which suggests that it was on the first day that the biggest losses were suffered. I don't know whether the Ukrainians intend to persist in these attacks. There may be some sense in which this last attack on Kuzinka was a last throw, that someone, perhaps Kirill Budanov, the likely person who was the instigator of this operation. Anyway, perhaps in desperation, as it became clear that there was no prospect of breaking through the border, perhaps Kirill Budanov came up with this plan at the last moment of inserting these special forces troops into Kuzinka, partly by helicopter. Perhaps that was how it was done, why it was done. It could be, it might be a last throw. But anyway, whatever, the losses are huge. So far, there is nothing to show for them. One might take issue with the Russian claims about losses. But as I said, on multiple occasions, there is actually corroboration from the Ukrainian side for these Russian claims. And the Russians almost certainly are telling the truth about the equipment losses, the 18 tanks and the 23 armoured fighting vehicles, of which we know many are Bradleys in, one suspects, increasingly short supply, which have also been lost on this series of massively ill-conceived operations. Now, yesterday I discussed the fact that 
a source, a very reliable source, had told me that the Russians had been tipped off in advance about these attacks on the border and was prepared, and that the ultimate plan, the original plan, was for the Ukrainians to push on and capture a nuclear weapons storage facility in Belgorod region, and that this was the ultimate target and objective of these attacks. And I confess I expressed surprise about this over the course of my programme and wondered whether the Russians would indeed leave nuclear weapons in a storage facility so close to the border, which in this part of the conflict is also the conflict line. But shortly after I said that, lo and behold, confirmation came my way from the same source. He provided open source confirmation that this nuclear facility does indeed exist. This whole thing, what that does for me, is it makes this whole thing appear even more crazy. And before I proceed, by the way, I should say I apologise to the source for having doubted him about the nuclear facility. I have consistently found that his information is correct and accurate. Here we see another example. It's just that this seemed altogether so wild that I, I, I had to wonder where it, whether it could be true, but it looks as if it probably was. Well, not probably was. It looks as if it was. And the source also said that the Russians had been tipped off, and lo and behold, we're now getting reports from Kiev that Zelensky and his top people have come to the same conclusion. There was apparently a high-level meeting in Kiev, which a furious Zelensky himself attended, and apparently the hunt is underway now in Kiev to find out who the spy was who leaked this information to the Russians. Of course, it may be that there is no spy. It could be that the Russians have managed to break Ukrainian signals. It may be that they got the information in some other way. It may be, and this is not impossible, that the Russians were tipped off about this escapade by someone in the West who was also massively alarmed about this Ukrainian plan to seize a nuclear weapons facility. Of course, it may be that the Russians some time ago moved the nuclear weapons out of it. Who knows? But anyway, um, it could be that the Russians obtained this information through all kinds of ways and means, and I'm not going to speculate, but whatever, the Ukrainians have convinced themselves that they're dealing with a spy and they're now on the hunt looking for him. Now, we'll see whether the Ukrainians continue to double down on this disastrous operation. But it has proved to be a disaster. It was obviously timed for the Russian presidential election in which voting, by the way, began today, and it has miscarried catastrophically. Now, perhaps over the next couple of hours, Budanov will be able to pull some rabbit out of the hat and convert a cataclysmic failure into some kind of PR success doesn't look likely at the moment. But it's important to stress that whatever success the Ukrainians might have been working towards, barring the seizure of a nuclear weapons facility, 
it would have been purely a presentational one. Because the major battle continues. And we're getting a cascade of news this morning. Now, I have been pointing out for some time that the fact that the Russian Defence Ministry has been providing us with less information from the Bakhmut area and on one particular day stopped providing us with information from the Bakhmut area entirely might be a sign of Russian military operations being pushed forward. And, well, today we got news of a very fast Russian advance indeed to the southwest of Ivanivska. The Russians apparently have captured a whole block of territory and their forces have arrived at the Severodonetsk, uh, oh, sorry, not the sea, at the Seversky uh, Donetsk Canal. And it looks as if Ukrainian forces further south in the Andreevka, Pleshevka area, well, I'm not going to say that they've been completely cut off, but they've been isolated from the main Ukrainian forces still in Chasov Yar, and almost certainly they'll have to pull back over the next few hours. So, dramatic collapse in the Ivanivska area. The Ukrainians still control the few houses in Ivanivska vi uh, uh, village, um, in the northwest of the village. Apparently the Russians would need to capture a hill, a strategic hill, um, which the Ukrainians occupy immediately to the northwest of this village, Ivanivska, in order to be able to fully secure control of the village. Doubtless that will happen at some point over the next couple of days. But we see from these reports, which I assume, by the way, are true, that the Russians have indeed managed to capitalise on their on their advance in, in Ivanivska and that they are now already on the Seversky Donetsk Canal. And this is a crisis for the Ukrainians. be interesting to see what they do, but it's plausible that over the next few days, the Ukrainians will have to withdraw from Ivanivska and that the battle for Chasofya, which the Russians, by the way, have been relentlessly bombing for weeks now, that the battle for Chasofya will begin in earnest. If, of course, it is indeed the intention of the Russians to cross the Seversky Donetsk Canal and to capture Chasofya. I suspect it is. So that's very bad news for the Ukrainians there. There's also bad news for the Ukrainians further north. It seems that the Russians have continued their advance towards the Zherebets River. It, there is still fighting going on in the village in Terni, but it seems that the Russians have been more intent in capturing territory fields around Terni, both to the north and the south and the east of Terni, rather than storming the village itself. Probably the calculation is that once the village is in effect encircled, the Ukrainians will be forced to pull back. But anyway, it does look as if the Russians are close to establishing positions on the Zherebets River as well potentially opening the way for a strike on Le towards Liman to the west. And um, it also seems that in the area of Siversk, the Russians are now finally approaching the point where they would plausibly capture the village of Belogorodka 
in northwest Lugansk region. Apparently, there are reports that the Russian troops have reached the centre of this bitterly contested village and that Ukrainian defences here are starting to crumble as well. So all bad news on that front. There's also further reports today of more Russian advances in the village of Pervomaisky to the southwest of Avdevka, uh, not village, rather, small town of Pervomaisky, and in the Avdevka battle lines, there is now confirmed film showing Russian troops in the western outskirts of the village of Berdichi, which suggests that this village is about to pass fully and conclusively under Russian control. And there are, of course, reports that the same situation applies to Orlovka further south. So very bad news for the Ukrainians there. And further still, further south still, the Russians apparently also engaging the Ukrainians intensely in Krasnogorovka. And many reports that Ukrainian troops are being pulled out of Krasnogorovka, which also looks like it's about to fall. And the Russians pushing through Georgievka and Novomikhailovka, these other two important villages to the south, and starting to launch more attacks around um, the town of Vugleda at the far southern end of the Donbass front lines. So, bad news for the Ukrainians on the battlefronts as well. Now, I touched on an article that has appeared in Strana, very, actually very good Ukrainian um, media outlet, generally oppositional in its stance towards the Zelensky government, so much so that, as I understand it, it is now published from abroad. It, doesn't, it isn't published from within Ukraine itself. But anyway, there was an interesting commentary there, which um, appeared to give a somewhat optimistic spin to Ukrainian prospects over the next few months and doubted that the Russians seriously intend to advance and capture all of these various places that I've been referring to, Chasovya, Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky, Novomikhailovka, um, Vugleda, and all of the rest. And the article spoke about how these would be fortified, heavily fortified village, villages, or towns rather, towns, which it would take the Russians months to capture. Well, I think we need to take a step back and consider the kind of places that the Russians have captured in the past. They have captured Mariupol in the early spring of 2022. Mariupol population around 275,000 before the war. It's by some distance the biggest single city uh, populated center captured by either army over the course of this conflict. The Russians then went on to capture the entire Severodonetsk Lizichansk conurbation. Now, this is made up of various towns, um, Severodonetsk, Lizichansk, uh, Popaznaya, and others. I believe that, has a, that had an aggregate population of around 350,000. And again, these were fortified positions. Um, the Russians then, at the start of last year, in May last year, captured... Bakhmut, which had a pre-war population of 70,000, and also 
of various towns and villages around it, including Soledad, which, to my knowledge, had a population of around 10,000. The Russians, in December, finally completed the long battle of Marinka and have captured Marinka, again, population 10,000. Over the last few weeks, they've captured Avdevka, the most heavily fortified position of all, population before the war, 32,000. They're in the process of capturing Pervomaisky, population 28,000. And they're also in the, pro in the process of capturing Krasnogorovka as well, population 14,000. Chasovya has a population, had a population before the war of around 12,000. If we go further west, well, Kramatorsk and Slavyansk are much bigger. They would have populations of around 150,000 each, but they would in either case, still be smaller than Mariupol or than the Severodonetsk, Lizichansk, conurbation. The point I'm making is that many of these places, which the writer at Strana thinks it might take the Russians months to capture, are significantly smaller than places that the Russians have captured already. So that Krasnogorovka, with a population of around 14,000, is less than half the size of Avdevka, which the Russians recently captured. Pervomaisky, with a population of around 28,000, is about the same size as Avdevka, a bit smaller. Chasofya, 12,000 significantly smaller. So I don't see these things, these capture these places as insuperably difficult for the Russians. They have captured bigger, more heavily fortified places before. And of course the Russians now are able to bomb these towns, these fortified towns in a way that they were not able to do earlier in the war, because earlier in the war, Ukraine was able to keep the Russian Air Force at bay because of its very sophisticated air defences, which it no longer has. So, to me, it looks like a critical situation. And to repeat a point which I've made over my previous two videos, it is likely that over the course of the next few weeks, we will start to see a whole series of places fall under Russian control. Um, Novomikhailovka, Georgievka, um, Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky, the three villages west of Avdevka, Berdichi, perhaps already in effect under Russian control, Orlovka, perhaps the same, Toninka, and then further north still, Ivanivska, Bogdanovka, Klesheevka, Andreevka, and perhaps the forlong Chasov Yar. It seems to me that what we are seeing is the first weeks of the decisive battle for the Donbass. The Russians are attacking the Ukrainians in what used to be the strongest part of the Ukrainian, Ukrainians' defences. They're gaining control of the vital railway and transport lines. And if all of these places that I spoke spoke about are captured, not only is central Donbass going to be falling rapidly under Russian control, 
but the Russians will have rid themselves of the difficult topography that has held them back in the Donbass, the dense the density of urban settlements, the multiple rivers and streams and canals, the soft ground, the, um, the woods and forests, they'll have not only rid themselves of that, and by the way, of all the heavy fortifications, but they will be in a strong position to advance towards the major remaining populated centres. Pakrovsk, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, and to push on west towards the Dnieper River and to arrive opposite Dniepro, one of Ukraine's key industrial and logistics hubs and the place where perhaps the war will be decided. So, overall, this looks like a very, very dark picture on the battlefront, indeed. And we see that even pick people like Macron and um, Josep Borrell can see it. And of course, to reiterate again, all the problems that are accumulating, the lack of ammunition, the shortages of tanks and armoured vehicles, the shortages of artillery pieces, the problems with the drones, which the Russians are now successfully, increasingly successfully jamming, the manpower shortages and the mobilisation law still seems to be stuck in the radar with growing doubts that it will ever be implemented. And if it's passed, that it will provide Ukraine with even a fraction of the half million men that Ukraine is supposed to need. Anyway, all of those problems are accumulating, which will cause the downward slide when it starts in earnest probably to accelerate. It's not surprising, in a sense, that Ukraine is trying to carry out these stunts on the border. It's not surprising that a volatile, and if I have to say it frankly, unstable person like Macron is starting to freak out. Because the war in Ukraine is being lost. Putin, over the course of his interview with Sergei Kiselyov, made it pretty clear that it is going to be all but impossible to satisfy him fully in a negotiation process. He's not completely closing the door there, but it doesn't look easy at all. And, well, all I will say is panic is never a good thing to do. It's a very bad counsellor. But both the Ukrainians and the Western powers, as they face strategic disaster in Ukraine, have good cause to panic. Well, that's the end of my programme today. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Also, please do check out our shop. I mentioned yesterday that you can find uh, that we're doing a limited edition of St. Patrick's shirts. Shirts for St. Patrick's Day. Actually, there are lots of other items apparently for St. Patrick's Day also coming out on our shop. So please look out for them. And last but not least, if you like this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.